This episode of Ask the Masters podcast is brought to you by National Pool Tile. Welcome to the Ask the Masters podcast today. My name is Dave Petton, and today I will be listening alongside you as SWD Master Grant Smith sits down with Alan Smith to discuss concrete science, specifically in relation to pool plaster. Hello, and welcome to the Ask the Masters podcast. This podcast is dedicated to discussions about the design and construction of water shapes. The hosts of the show are all certified SWD masters who represent the leading builders and designers within the water shaping industry today. Hi, uh, welcome to another episode of uh, Ask the Masters. I'm Grant Smith with Aqualine Pools and Spas, and we have Alan Smith from Alan Smith Pools, uh, plastering and remodeling. Uh, Alan, uh, welcome, and thanks for coming by and spending some time with us. Thank uh, you, Grant. Yeah, Glad absolutely. So, uh, so I know you've been around, you know, the business for a long time. You've been kind of like a mainstay here, especially in Southern California area. You know, plastering pools, and I mean, you've expanded your business out from there. So, kind of tell us how you got started and how you got. Uh, you know, why plasters especially was something that was of interest to you? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, you know, shortly after I graduated from high school, uh, I needed a job. Had friends that worked at uh, D. Mar Baron Pool Plastering. And uh, believe it or not, actually, I started my first job I really had. I was a commercial fisherman. I was uh, worked on a tuna boat, oh, wow. of all things. Kind of, you know, fill in the gaps there, make a little extra money. And, uh, uh, you know, the Marines wouldn't take me. I had a heart murmur oh, and uh, heart. had a few things going with that. So I worked on a commercial jack pole boat, uh, realized in short order that it wasn't my career. And uh, so I uh, got picked up by uh, DeMar Baron Pool Plastering. I just went in, in uh, early, early one morning. And I remember uh, Lynn Radford, the uh, vice president, when I shook hands with him, he turned my hand around and he saw solid calluses on my palms. and said, how did you get those? And I said, from hard work, sir. And he hired me on the spot. Right. So, yeah. So I started there and uh, uh, learned the trade fairly quickly. I think uh, by the time I was almost 20, I was 19 actually, uh, I became a foreman. So I learned fairly quickly and uh, started uh, running crews for Barron at the time. They, I believe they were in an eight uh, plaster crews only doing, you know, 99% new construction, new plaster work. and. In the right. winter, they'd throw a few replasters in there. Right. But that's that's when I started back in 1974. And, uh, and then, how did you end up just getting your own business? Just after a while, you okay, this is I I want to kind of strike out on my own, and then, you know, or were your thoughts you could do a little bit better than your your company did, or just decided to you know I need to be on my own? Well, uh, it was a little bit more than that. I um, you know I was uh, plastering pools for a while, and then I actually. Uh, went to the Masons Union uh, and started learning Brick Lane for a short season and uh, was doing that. And that was right around the time of the Jimmy Carter era. Uh, we, you know, economy was way right. down. You couldn't buy the building yeah. permit. Uh, things were tough. And uh, I thought, oh, maybe, you know, I'll get back into pools on the remodel stuff. And uh, I thought remodels because it really wasn't con uh, linear linked with new construction. You know, right. an old pool gets old, it needs to be done. And I remember uh, when I was a foreman running a crew uh, one winter, I think I was around 20 or 21, I was doing a replaster and I was sitting on the deck in the winter. Uh, the lady brought us out uh, bacon and egg sandwiches and some coffee. And I said, sure, it's nice doing work directly with homeowners and not through pool builders. Right. You know, they yeah. treat you really nice and right. all that. And I go, one of these days, all these pools will need to be replastered. And I said, that'd be a really good niche to get into and just go direct homeowner to homeowner. And I really, the seed was planted fairly young okay. with me. So you did, uh, when you first started out, you just basically just did remodels and didn't do a lot of new pools? I uh, still don't. Okay. Um, you know, uh, we've just recently finished our 30,000th uh, pool uh, project and uh, less than a thousand of those were new construction. Okay. So uh, we carved our teeth uh, right out of the chute with the renovation. Okay. It's gotcha. always been our niche. Right. Okay. So you've seen all the good and bad and of uh, uh, pools and you good, know. the bad, the ugly. The ugly. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, really ugly. Uh, from every type of construction practice, uh, from really good, thoughtful contractors to uh, guys that were trying to save money or right. just didn't know what they were doing and. Uh, all the construction defect and shortcuts and right. everything you can possibly imagine because the renovation it's not like new construction you build everything right. off of a process uh, that you know it's a blank slate we're coming in and we're discovering right. who knows what 
as yeah. soon as you jump into the job, and so things uh, get pretty fluid and change quickly. Right, right. Why don't you get into a little bit more about the calcium chloride and how that you know works and plastering the pool and the process and <clears throat> and uh, and because that's been a bit of a discussion here lately. Yeah. Um, so why don't you kind of expand on that? Well, calcium uh, chloride is an interesting uh, discussion. There's a lot of misinformation out there about that, unfortunately. Uh, uh, whether it's put out by certain people or not for whatever reasons, I just think uh, to understand how it works and what it does is really important. Um, calcium chloride is basically, a, a, we use powder form. It comes in powder, prill, flakes, liquid, whatever. It, it helps uh, speed up the set time of uh, Portland cement. Uh, we, we use it uh, basically on cooler, damper days. Um, a lot of our pebble finishes, we don't use any or much at all because it seems to set okay yeah. on its own. Yeah. There's, a, there's a limit in the cement industry, I think, um, American Concrete Institute, ACI, recommends 2% right. to weight of, uh, of 2 of calcium to weight of cement. Well, do you know why that is? Why they, they came up with 2%? I mean, it's basically because when you add calcium to concrete with steel reinforcing, more than 2% calcium will start uh, oxidizing or rusting the steel, or could. And so that's where the limit was set. Now, pool plaster doesn't have steel in it. Right. And so there's no reaction to that at the 2% level. Mm. Uh, but if you go much more than 2%, like 3%, 3.5%, you can get shading differences. So instead of the mm -hmm. nice white you're looking for, it could go more towards a light green or a light gray hue. Now all on its own, it's hard to see, but side by side with the white finish, it might be a little bit more. Um, so that's one of the biggest things. Now, calcium uh, chloride, I've heard it been said out there by some groups uh, very inaccurately that you can't use it with colored finishes and right. pools. Well, there's some literature out there, I think Davis Color and Schofield has out there that uh, on some of their mixes that not recommended when you're picking a concrete color, you know. Uh, and the reason they say that is because if you use uh, calcium chloride with uh, some of their pigments, you can get a shading difference instead of you wanted mm -hmm. a, you know, a, a, a San Juan color, it could be a little lighter, or a little darker. Uh, but that's only with gray cements and concretes is the recommendation. The reason is, is because calcium chloride reacts with ferrous oxide. That's a product in gray cement. That's the product in gray cement that makes gray cement gray. Um, and that can react with that and shade it up or down. White cement doesn't have that in there. And so there is no reactionable product for that. So calcium, uh, Portland Cement Association just did a joint paper of the National Plasters Council, right. uh, clearly explaining that. So uh, that's been unfortunate uh, misinformation out there. Now, I'm not an advocate of using too much calcium because right. it makes the product dry so fast you can't keep up with it right. as far as troweling. And, and uh, nobody adds a lot of calcium to make harder work for everybody. It's just you're in the concrete business. Right. You want a nice, even, slow set. Uh, I mean, the slower it goes, you actually work easier, and sometimes you finish quicker right. because you're not trying to catch up to it. Well, same in the plastering thing. Guys aren't blowing pools up just because they can. You know, we, we like to finish them at a nice, steady right. pace. And right. uh, so it's a good tool, right. and it helps strengthen it. We even did a research at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo at different uh, calcium levels from 0 to 5%. And we found out less etching happened with the higher percentages of calcium, uh, maybe because it made it harder quicker, right. and it was harder for it to dissolve. I don't advocate 5% calcium to anybody because right. it dries so fast you can't even get it through the pump hoses. Um, so, uh, but understanding the, the benefits of it is clearly uh, important, especially uh, how to properly use it and right. kind of get some of those uh, myths, <laughs> we'll call them, out of the way. Hi, I'm Grant Smith with Oculine Pools and Spas. I'm here with Abel Delora from NPT, National Pool Tile. Abel, thanks for coming by. Thank you for having me. All right, you guys sell lots of tile and pool plaster. Uh, so right. why don't you tell me a little bit about what kind of plasters you sell and, and what, you, you know, what, what, what you support the builder and, and how you do that. So we offer a wide variety of different aggregate pool finishes that compete with all the major manufacturers of 
different offerings. Right. So as far as some of your aggregates, you know, I, of course, would use some of the aggregates that you guys sell, uh, you know, because we do all sorts of types of pool, different pool finishes. Now, one of the pebble aggregates that you sell also has what's called a touch of glass. Can you kind of elaborate on that? Because it's not like a full on glass bead, like, uh, you know, some of the previous manufacturers had. So right. what does that incorporate as far as like pebble and glass and, and the ratio? Well, one of the things that our pool, pool finish as being component is they're, they're put together like a batch of cookies. This is how right. we explain it to our homeowners when they're right. looking at the process they're asking us what it is. And uh, the nice thing about that is we can add different aggregates uh, based on what people's preference are, what right. people uh, prefer. And that's where the touch of glass and, mm -hmm. and some of these in the uh, Puerto Rico blend right. uh, series came out of where you're using an aggregate pool finish of, of mostly pebble, whether it's right. regular or mini, um, and soon to be micro, but uh, we can add a little bit of glass per batch to, uh, to right. basically sprinkle uh, the, mm -hmm. the glass out of it. So you right. get some of the, the uh, upgrade look right. by having some glass aggregate in it, right. but you're not paying for a full-on 100% um, glass bead aggregate. Right. So hence the reason to touch a glass. Right. Kind of right. Okay, gotcha. Right. So going back to that, um, you know, like you were talking about some pre-blended mixes. Now, a lot of manufacturers, you know, they do, do certain guarantees, you know, with the plasters. What's in National Pool Tile offer as far as warranties and then training and support? Well, we have a uh, standard warranty for all our pool finishes, depending on the pool finish itself, it, it varies. Um, but we also have a approved applicator program where we have, we go out to uh, all over the country and train uh, uh, different applicators so that they become certified in each one of our pool finish series. Um, so they become uh, certified in, in stonescapes right. or jewelscapes and, and so forth. Um, what that allows us to do and what it allows the contractor to do is to offer a uh, limited lifetime warranty on our product oh, wow. uh, because they've gone through the training, they've right. got, they understand what our requirements are and we provide that support to the contractor and the applicator. You know, the nice thing about how we name our pool finishes is right. the aggregate or the process of, right. of what's being used is how we name it. So we okay. have jewelscapes, that's a right. jewel aggregate pool finish, sure. stonescapes, sure. Um, uh, quartz scapes, right. plaster scapes, and uh, our newest right. one, which is a polished scapes, which is a polished marble aggregate finish. Right. So the great thing about uh, National Pool Tile, which you're a part of Pool Corp, is you have distributors pretty much everywhere. Right. So the nice thing is most all the stuff is in stock, uh, and then it's available anytime. Right. Uh, because you have, tell us a little bit about the distribution that you guys have. So we have over 300 sales centers throughout the country. Again, having it being a component is we source the products that go into our, to our pool right. finishes locally um, so that we can have it available um, right. when, whenever people need it. Right, great. And the, and the great thing that I just noticed is you handed me this brochure right. you know, right here today. And the great thing that I noticed is that you have new stuff in the brochure and of course on your website where it can actually show the color variations throughout the day. Right. So um, so that's the biggest thing I always get asked from homeowners is, you know, a lot of times we're like, okay, I want I want a pebble to go with my tile. And I always tell homeowners, don't pick up, you know, a pebble or a color mm -hmm. plaster just to go with the tile, pick it for the watercolor. Correct. So the great thing about this brochure and on the website is you can see the different, you know, how the sun hits it at different times of day and how it truly looks. So you can really inform your homeowner about it. Right. And that's great because plaster and tile are always the two biggest things that make homeowners nervous. Right. Yeah, especially the plaster. I mean, they'll, mm -hmm. uh, and it's great that at the sales center that you guys had that, uh, those photos and, and also your warranties because you can right. reassure the homeowner. We've upgraded our website that's got a ton of galleries, a, a, a ton of documentation, um, not just for homeowners, uh, but also for contractors. Um, we're advocates of the National Plasters Council startup process. That's kind of part of our uh, okay. system. Um, so that educates people on that, uh, of how that pool is supposed to be maintained. Um, but mainly uh, galleries and a sure. bunch yeah. of different projects that has our tile and our pool finishes um, different times of the day in right. different markets so that people get a real idea what projects yeah. can look like. Um, we also share a ton of our, of our stuff on our um, Instagram page at MPT Pool Products is our, is our Instagram mm -hmm. platform, yeah. and we're constantly sharing projects uh, so that when homeowners are looking, yeah, what, they, what, they yeah. don't know what they're picking, right, they don't yeah. know what they yeah. even, to, where you'd even start, right. and they can start getting ideas, oh, I like that, I like that. Right. We'd let them know what it is, whether yeah. it's a Portscapes Barbados Blue or, right. or a Stonescapes Touch of Glass or Puerto Rico Blend. They can see that, and they have a little bit more of an idea. So, so you guys have a new app out too. Right. So, let us know what that app does. Well, we have an app uh, available in Android and iPhone, um, and it 
goes over all of our pool finishes, all of our tile. Um, it, it, depending on the market that you're using, whether you're using decorative concrete or natural stone. And then if they go to the app or they go to, to, to our social media site or they go right, to our yeah, website, yeah. They, there's a, a ton of different projects that are completed that have our finishes and our tiles right. in it that it, it, uh, it yeah. really lets them see these projects um, completed. Right. Well, Abel, thanks for stopping by and telling us all about your products. Well, thank so, you for having as me. As you know, I use your products, so you know I'm a, I'm a believer. So um, you know, thanks for coming and uh, appreciate all the good info. Awesome, thank you so thanks. much. Now, going back to like color plasters, um, you know, I think a lot of people. There's a lot. Every time you do a color plaster, you know, typically a lot of plaster companies will make the homeowner sign a release <laughs> as far as like the modeling. You know, the plaster. Can you kind of delve into that and why sure. you get in? Why there is modeling? Because that's always a big, you know, with homeowners they don't understand and pool builders don't really have an explanation. So it'd be great to hear your opinion on that. Okay, that's a yeah. good one, right? So, uh, well, what we do as a company is. Um, we try to shy away from colored finishes just because of trying to meet customers' expectations, right? right? You always, uh, in any business, meeting a customer's expectations is really important. And so no matter how much you try to explain what modeling is or streaking or this or that or the other, what can happen, inevitably when it does happen, it's, I didn't know it was gonna look like that. Right. And what we've decided to do, and this is to answer your question a little bit, is we actually have a release with six pictures on it color pictures of streaking, modeling, carbonation, right. uh, very small craze cracking, which shows a little bit more in the color, and all those little things we're talking about, even spot etching showing up in color more. Right. Um, and I s tell the customer, we have no control over these things when they happen. We only warranty what we can control, which right. any smart businessman will only warranty what you have control over. If you understand that, we say that to the homeowner, sign here. Well, when they see those pictures, a lot of times they say, well, I don't want to live with that. And I say, then let's go to a pebble finish or right. something different. Now, the streaking and the discoloration, a lot of things can, can cause that. You know, I've heard people say, oh, our pools never do that. You know, and right. of course, they have as many problems as the next guy. Right. Um, but I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, how they dry, uh, yeah. sun hitting a wall, dries it quicker, it might uh, turn a little whiter or have a little more streaks because of how quickly it dries. Same with concrete, Right. same with house, smooth child house plaster. Right. And what I'll show a customer is they're not understanding streaking or modeling or discoloration of color. When we're standing on a colored concrete deck, whether it's new or old, I say look under your feet and you see multiple colors. Yeah, same process. Right. It's the same right. process. Yeah, I go right. now, are you upset with the concrete contract? Well, normally they say, no, that's just what they do. I go, well, same with pool plaster. Yeah, although went, not always on that. Not always, yeah, okay. <laughs> but I mean, sometimes it's super uniform. Yeah, right. But yeah. can you tell them when that'll happen and when it won't? Right, exactly. It's the yeah. same with us, yeah. we can't either. Right. And so we try to set that expectation and then we try to do as a good a startup process, right. get water in as quickly as possible. Sure. Things that we do know will have some impact at the, at the final finish. Yeah. That, uh, to, you know, give them as quality of finish as we can that we do have control over. Right. But we certainly won't warranty what we don't control. Sure. And uh, try to get that all out there and explain that to them. Yeah. Now, some guys have had better luck than others. And uh, there might be uh, a certain type of pigment with a certain type of cement, maybe. Right. Um, but uh, I haven't delved into it to that level to yeah. really see uh, that. You know, yeah. And then invariably when you do have a customer says, oh, I really like that patina look with sure, the modeling. Yeah, right. That's the one that dries perfectly one color and right. then you get the patina. <laughs> yeah, right. So, uh, yeah. you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's just the way it goes, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, kind of talk about, you know, the starting of the pool. Um, you know, I think it's important to, as soon as that pool fills up, if, if at all possible, to you know, start that thing up. You know, and I know there's some, you know, there's some brands out there right now that are, you know, they have certain systems as far as startup chemicals and you can actually add, start adding some calcium or different chemicals in there as it's filling. Um, you know, uh, do you th do you believe also that, you know, the getting on a pool as quickly as possible to start it up is the key to it? Because, you know, I've seen guys that sit there and they'll let it fill and then they'll, the startup guy will make it out there like two days later. And yeah. to me, that's like way too long, you know, of a, you know, to sit there and that's where I think some of the problems come in also. Well, I think so too. Um, we've learned a lot. I've been, uh, uh, you know, I learned a lot at Cal Poly running, you know, 10 years of research there because I worked with IPSA and UPA right. guys and APSP, AP, APSP guys and 
uh, throughout the industry, we work together to solve problems, come up with right. answers, not just finger pointing, right? Yeah. And uh, I knew a lot going into that, but I learned a lot more. And we did a, a lot of concentrated research on startups. And uh, I think it's way more important uh, with uh, pool finishes that have a lot of cement at the surface because that a hydrating cement compound is the weak link, we'll call that, that has the calcium hydroxide. That is the right. most reactionable product in the whole uh, matrix of whatever finish you put in. Right. And so your smooth troweled white or quartz finishes um, need to be taken care of because uh, they're hydrating. When we're done troweling, right. um, that cement needs to be what's called pond cured. That's what both Portland Cement Association, ACI, and I mean, you need to get water on it right away. And so we start to fill them. Well, you still have a, a, what's called hydrating. It's still the calcium compounds in the cement are hydrating. And it's important to add on the startup question or what we call the initial water treatment. We call right. the IWT in our co company. Um, have to understand what you're doing to what. In other words, uh, pool plaster or any type of pool finish has five different calcium compounds in it, like all cement products or concrete products. Right. The most soluble uh, one is calcium hydroxide. Soluble means it's how fast it dissolves. Mm. Well, at the very beginning, that product is still forming and still hydrating and getting harder and harder and harder and harder. When the water first goes on it, it hasn't reached its complete hardness right. yet, so it's very, still very, very soluble. So if you don't know what you're filling it with, in other words, if you have low calcium hardness water, right. it'll start to pull that calcium or dissolve it out of the pool uh, matrix to buffer, to equalize with that water that doesn't have it in there. It's more aggressive than the, the, the surface it's going over. Right. So uh, we recommend, and uh, what we do is we actually uh, uh, measure the fill water mm -hmm. before we start. Right. And then we'll uh, put like a big barrel of water and we'll add calcium to the barrel, dissolve it uh, to the point where it, when the pool's full, it'll be, depending on the finish, 250 parts per million, 300 parts right. per million of calcium. And uh, what we do is we get like a little piece of uh, aquarium tubing and do a slow IV drip down to the hose so it's dripping right. calcium into that as it's filling so it's buffered yeah. water right. and it's not calcium hungry and along that we'll have another drip system with a uh, sequestrant stain preventer mm -hmm. or something in there we've used a bunch of them I like a lot of different ones yeah. and uh, so we're eliminating a lot of plaster dust uh, we seem right. to have a lot more uniformity in right. color whether it's pebble right. or even the smooth plaster and it eliminates a lot of uh, plaster dust removal at the beginning for us. Right. Uh, but in any case, even if you don't do that, to get a calcium uh, a measurement of the water and adjustment as soon as it's full right. is the minimum. Yeah. And I know the Plasters Council has recommended that in their startup and get that done right away so it right. doesn't continue, if it is, deteriorate in the surface. Right. And the deterioration can be from super minor to right. you know extreme. And, and uh, it's hard to tell how much that's going to affect it later on. Right. Now, do you try to get that calcium level up as quickly as possible, or do you wait? I mean, do you bring some up a little bit at a time, like every day? Because I know there's uh, startup procedures, and typically I think the MPC is recommending like a 14-day you know, startup procedure, whether you do that in 14 days in a row or every other day. Well, or... th that's two different questions there. Okay. How quick do you bring up the calcium right. and how long is your startup procedure? Right. Uh, we try to bring calcium up as quickly as possible. Okay. First visit, we have our uh, little spreadsheet of X amount of gallons, mm -hmm. how, what's the cal how much calcium we had to get it to a certain point. Right. And that adjustment's made that day. We'll retest it the next day, okay, right. you know, and maybe make an adjustment from there. If we're a little high, it doesn't bother us. If we're right. a little low, we'll add a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but as far as the length of the startup, um, what we do is we we'll, we usually give five to seven trips. Mm -hmm. You know, start with several days in a row. They maybe skip a day or two, right. uh, depending on the. It's more of a fragile, what I call a fragile finish, like a plaster, right. uh, as opposed to a much more durable quartz finish, uh, or, or excuse me, or pebble finish. Right. And then uh, most of the jobs we do are referred to us by pool service guys, and there's pool mm -hmm. service uh, technician on the job. Right. We hand it off to them and let them continue monitoring that. Uh, Right. But um, your re reaction and hydration uh, is still going on, so you can have a little chemical manipulation. Uh, your pH, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit uh, might change with that. But uh, most of these guys are pretty sharp. 
we give some pretty detailed instructions for those third and fourth weeks to what to do. Okay. We've yeah. been very successful with that. And uh, I don't want to stay on that job for 30 days. Well, yeah, yeah, for sure. I can help it. I mean, five to seven trips. Right. Sometimes we'll go eight or nine trips. Right. Uh, We've done that. We've done some jobs as quick as three or four. Um, uh, But we really want to give them their money's worth, and we want to leave the pool well balanced. Right. And that's our main thing. So uh, uh, I don't really look at how many days. I want to give them enough to make sure the product's taken care of. But if we have to go several more, it's... We have no issue with that at right. all. Right. Each pool is different, you know, because like you said, sometimes it balances out in three to four days, and then other times it can take right. a couple of weeks. So. And then you'll have like a junior Olympic pool, you right. know, which is, you know, a whole different deal. You, yeah. And you know, we're kind of on it until the health department signs it off, right. you know, and the, <laughs> yeah. the chlorine reading right. and, yeah. and all that. So some of those we're alone for three, four weeks until the health department get out and do the final inspection, right. and they test the, the chlorine level. Yeah. And we're responsible for that in a lot of cases. So. Yeah, right. Well, I kind of want to get into, I know you do a lot of remodel stuff. Is there a particular reason why you don't do a lot of new pools with builders? And maybe <clears throat> you know, maybe this might be, you know, some builders may hear this and not like it, but sometimes I think certain people need to hear certain things so they can improve, you know, the way they do business or will they even build a pool. Right. Well, this is just my own experience. Uh, you know, as a member of the National Plasters Council, the bulk of the members and uh, friends of mine uh, on the board and other places, they do a lot of uh, plastering for uh, new construction for pool builders. And uh, that might be uh, 50, 70, 80, 90 percent of their work. And a lot of them have picked up remodels as a way to keep mm. crews busy off season or whatever. Or some of them are really drifting more towards that just because of the amount of work. I kind of got into it early. It kind of hit me early on. I told you a story earlier. Right. I was sitting on a pool side when I, I was a 19-year-old foreman, believe it or not. And uh, a homeowner, uh, we're waiting for the scratch to dry, the first coat to right. dry. We're sitting on the deck. It was February. And I said to my finisher, I looked at him uh, after the customer brought us. I had a bacon and egg right. sandwich and a glass of orange juice or coffee yeah. and stuff. And I said, you know, when we do new construction, we never get that because their customers are kind of upset. The job's right. gone <laughs> a long time, right. and yeah, right. we're the last crew there. They want yeah. us out, you know, get yeah. the heck out of here. And But here we just came in or new, and, and I said, well, it's one of these days when I I might get just into the remodel business. How right. nice is that? Yeah. And it also really hit me, and this is really the main reason mm. I did it, is because I thought it was always recession-proof. Mm. And what I right. mean by that is uh, new construction really hinges sure. on new home building. Sure. And if that's down, uh, you're down. Yeah. Renovations, uh, for the most part, are um, must-do work. There's two right. types of reasons people do pools. is because they either want to or they have to. Right. Uh, remodels get old. Right. Re- yeah. And uh, they age, and something has to be done. Yeah. Residentials can hold off a little longer. Commercial work, health department will shut you down. Right. So uh, that's have-to-do work. Uh, so we kind of got into that and specialized in... Uh, remodels, right. the bonding, you know, on the remodel, you have to have a good bond, how it right. sticks. Uh, we dealt customer by customer. And uh, so I never really did very many new pools. Mm-hmm. Maybe uh, 95% of all the pools I've done have been renovation, pushing 30,000. Right. And uh, so that's kind of the reason we did that. And it's okay. worked out really well. We've weathered all the recessions. We've grown during recessions. Right. And uh, or we just have to kind of manipulate yeah. some of our overhead a little bit and keep things right. going. Yeah. Well, going back to getting back into the actual remodel process, um, like did delam- I mean, tile and plaster delaminations. When you go out and you know redo one, you know, I'm sure you see a ton of that. Um, and then, what do you do to mitigate some of that problems for you on the delamination? Yeah. Well, it's evolved. Uh, we don't see as many delaminations now here in Southern California as we used to. And that's because for the past 20 some years, people have been stripping the pools, pneumatically removing the uh, plaster, the the chipping hammers, electric jackhammers, to get to the gunite substrate, which bonds very good to that being so porous. When I got into the business, people were putting one coat of plaster right directly over the old coat by either chipping it with an ax to try to create something to to grab onto, um, acid washing it, sandblasting it, and going directly over it. Um, it wasn't ever porous enough to really get what I call a good mechanical bond. And so you had a lot of delaminations where it, right. it'd peel off and then you get the volcanoes where it lift off with a gigantic calcium nodule in right. the middle. And that's when I really started in the industry. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
So we, we really experiment with a lot of different things. You know, uh, we were kind of on the front end of the bond coats. Uh, that's where you actually get some type of a cementitious right. finish, put acrylic glues in there, trowel them on. We used to make our own. And we went from maybe a uh, one out of five failure of going right over old plaster to maybe a one out of 50 failure right. uh, with that, which is still kind of high, right. one yeah. out of 30. Uh, but we sandblasted it, uh, then we do an acrylic bond coat, and that's what we're doing. But we're still having a fair amount of those. And then we're running into pools with two and three coats of plaster. Right. And if you're going to give a long warranty, and we were given five-year warranties even back then, uh, your new surface is only as good as the old surface right. you've gone yeah. over. Right. So uh, we started stripping these pools uh, by removing all right. the coats of plaster down. And I was one of the first guys really around here to do that. And then it got to the point where it was so easy to do them that we stripped everything, whether right. it was the first coat or not. And uh, I, I moved to 10-year warranties against delamination, right. uh, which we still have. And, uh, and uh, we use big three-inch wide flat chisels to minimize the gunite sure, yeah. removal for several reasons, because the more gunite you remove, uh, the more material you got to put back in. Yeah. Uh, that wasn't so bad in the plaster days, but when you have the more expensive pebble finishes, glass right. bead finishes, hydrazo, polished finishes, two or three extra batches could be your complete profit margin on a job. Wow. Yeah. And so um, we did that for a number of years, and oh, probably five, six years ago, uh, we really started noticing, or even before that, that a lot of the pools that we were doing on the remodels had a lot of structural cracks. Mm -hmm. A lot of the hillside pools were right. breaking, and some of them, even that weren't structural, uh, or that on hillsides were starting to crack. And we're finding tons of rebound uh, in these, right. which is, we know the rebound's yeah. defective gunite that was reused in steps and benches, things like that. And so um, some of these pools that were cracking, uh, uh, attorneys got involved, right? Our favorite people right. in the pool business. Right. And uh, the question was starting to be asked, did stripping the pool shell make the pool stronger or weaker, Mr. Right. Plasterer. And what do you say on a deposition thing? Of course it doesn't make it stronger, it can only right. make it weaker. And so they're starting to buy a little, you know, a little responsibility or a lot of responsibility for the pool, pool structurally breaking. So we wanted to get away from that stripping practice and we moved into the uh, water jetting, right. where we, have, we actually use a 40,000 PSI water jet that can take off one, two, three, four, five coats of plaster. I can. Right. take holes right through the gunite if I want to with this uh, right. for the removal. Mm -hmm. And so we're not doing what we call shell trauma. Right. So the prepping method really is all about getting a good surface to bond to. And I have no qualms about sand blasting or water blast, right. light water blasting and bond coating. If it works, okay. Yeah. It's, it's non, uh, you know, uh, um, traumatizing to the shell. Right. Uh, but once you start to strip it, you really better know what you're doing, what you're getting yourself into, and right. do it without any uh, evasive gunite maneuver, right. removal so you yeah. don't uh, start causing other issues. Right. Well, I know Rebound, uh, back in the mid-2000s, 2004, 5, 6, there were, I felt bad for the plaster companies because, you know, you get the crack in the steps or the bench. Of course, the first reaction mm -hmm. is always blame the plaster guy because it's, you know, that's the surface they see, but in all reality, it was just rebound that was used. Yeah. Um, will that water jetting process take off any rebound that may be stuck onto the steps or the benches? Or Well, it does. Uh, 40,000 PSI, uh, it'll pull a hole right through th three and a half inch concrete in a okay. matter of seconds. Right. And uh, what we do on our proposals when we talk to a, a customer on a replaster, and number one, sometimes you can see rebound right. by a horizontal crack and steps and you right. already know what it's going to be there. Right. But we run into rebound right now, and I'd say one out of two pools. Wow. It's that high, uh, it, either from a little to a lot. Right. And uh, typically the rebounds used in the non-structural areas, sure. you know, yeah. that blowback uh, uh, gunite is thrown on steps and benches where there's really nothing that would be critical to the right. pool's uh, um, overall strength. And there's kind of maybe sometimes flashed back over with uh, other stuff. But what happens with the water blasting, uh, what water blasting really does, it either scarifies the old surface, whether it's pebble, quartz, or plaster, it makes it so rough, it looks like coral when it's done, right. if it's really a hard surface. So the new product can stick to that, or it'll take it right down to the bare gunite. Right. Some pools we do, it's half gunite, half surface, the old pool mm. surface still on. Other ones, it's all gunite. Uh, it just depends. But when you hit the rebound, uh, it'll just blow it up. Okay. Uh, or if not, uh, well, if there's still some pool surface on there, you 
um, every job we do when we're done uh, water blasting it, we tap on all the steps and benches, we drag a hammer, and anything that's hollow will mark with orange paint. And then we have to have the conversation with the customer and saying, this is what we explained to you in our proposal. This is a TBD, a TB determined right. on a post demo inspection. Uh, here you have, you know, uh, 80 feet of steps and 60 of them have yeah. rebound in them. And we got to tear all that out and rebuild that. That'll be X amount of dollars. Right. And then uh, we yeah. rebuild them. Okay. Yeah. Steps, benches. We've had entire spa benches disappear. Wow. We've had entire sets of steps turn into yeah. ski slopes. Right. Um, we've had uh, one to two inches of rebound on floors where they just spread it out in the whole entire floor. Uh, and then that comes out and now we got steel showing. Yeah. And we have to bring a gunite truck in and you know, right. all of a sudden you got a five, six, seven thousand dollar re gunniting of a pool. Right. Uh, just to flash it yeah. over. And uh, you know, but you never know. Right. You know, yeah. until you get that down into there, but the customer uh, gets to experience a nice change order, right. you know, but yeah. they've been pre-warned by yeah, us. Right, correct, yeah. You know, yeah. and so, uh, yeah. yeah. A lot of times we'll do like a core sample in, in a pool. Before We don't do, I personally don't do a lot of remodels. Um, you know, just for some of the things you were saying, they're, they can be getting into somebody else's shell that you don't know what you're getting into. So we'll end up doing some core test, and then we'll let the homeowner know, hey, if we do the core test, when you find some issues with it, then it's up to you whether you patch it back up or... And or, core tests yeah. are nice, yeah. but that's only where you're doing the core. Right, true, yeah. You right. know, and a lot of these shells we run into, there's rebound here or there. You right. don't know where it's yeah. going to be. Right. And uh, we've had some pools where, you know, one side of the pool is 2,500 PSI, and you run yeah. into other parts, it's 1,500. Yeah. Right. Uh, I don't know if they run a low in cement when they're yeah. shooting right. it or yeah. something well, in yeah. the mixing yeah. and the gunite truck wasn't going right. Right. And then, uh, you know, but that's... Uh, always that you know risk factor yeah, you risk take factor in there so well going back to chemicals a little bit with like the cyanuric acid i know that's another big thing um you know what's your thoughts on that as far as like the level what it should be and how it affects plaster and uh the conditioner right, levels conditioner level, uh, right. and the pool yeah. water uh yeah that, again this cyanuric acid stabilizer mm -hmm. um we all know what that is right. that was uh, added back in i think the 60s mm -hmm. uh to chlorine um well, there's, it's a good product when it's used properly. And I remember working with uh, the people from Arch Chemical at the Cal Poly thing. I believe it was Paul Loomis was there with us, bright guy. Mm -hmm. uh, I said the misuse of trichlor or stabilizer is the problem, not right. trichlor itself. And I agree with that. I like so many things. The misuse of right. calcium chloride, if it's not, you know, way too much can't be good. But um, cyanuric acid... Uh, you know, I believe, and what it says in uh, most of the uh, manufacturers' uh, recommendations, the test kits, uh, you know, Bob Lowry's writing on that, that you really don't need much more than 15, 20, 30 parts right. per million. Yeah. And uh, what we find out uh, with the pools that I see that have problems, a lot of the pools that have the spot etching, or uh -huh. um, uh, we test the water, and 99% of them has elevated cyanuric levels. Right. 150, 300, 600, wow. 800, wow. Uh, we stopped measuring. Right. Uh, it's been on a steady uh, um, diet of uh, tabs right. for years and years and years and years. They have two, three floaters in it. Yeah. Oh, my chlorine doesn't work anymore. I gotta add more of these. Well, right. the more cyanuric right. acid, the higher TDS, the less likely as your chlorine's gonna yeah. be effective. So they just compound yeah. the issue. Um, and what happens with the stabilizer, I mean, the Taylor test kit has it in there, and I think Table K, it shows, uh, you know, you the higher that gets, it has an effective, uh, it has an effect on the measurement of the mm -hmm. alkalinity, specifically right. the carbonate alkalinity. You have tested alkalinity, carbonate alkalinity. And um, a lot of the service uh, techs or homeowners, when they're uh, looking at their test kits, and says, oh, my alkalinity only says it's 90. Right. I'm okay, or 100. But their cyanuric levels at 200 or 300, you, and you adjust that to that uh, mm -hmm. alkalinity factor, and alkalinity could be a 10. Right. You know, and they don't even know it. They've yeah. got an ongoing acid right. bound. Now that's a slow process of that happen. It doesn't be 300 parts per million overnight. Right. It's slow. It starts out low. Right. And then it compounds. It takes months and years, and when the water slowly starts to get aggressive and that adjustment factor isn't being made, you know, the saturation index is the measurement of how corrosive the water is to the uh, pool surface or right. scaling. Yeah. That saturation index 
saturation index slowly starts to move to the negative. And so as it slowly starts to get to the negative, it starts to go after the most soluble compounds in the surface first. Right. And that's your calcium hydroxide. <clears throat> Doesn't do it all at once and dissolve everything. Right. It just dissolves that first over time. And that's why you see like a spot etch takes time to develop as water slowly starts to go after that. And as you know, you're in the cement business, calcium hydroxide lives in all the gaps, microstructures, and voids in a cement matrix. Around every little grain of sand you see is a little halo of calcium hydroxide, and that's the first to go up at the surface, and that's why you see it in the spotting. Right. Most of that we see is because of conditioner levels right. uh, not being adjusted. Yeah. So as it's a good product to use. Right. Leave it at 30, yeah. 50 if you have to, and then right. uh, switch to a non-stabilized chlorine, right. you know, go liquid, go calhypo, but right. anything but stabilize. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if trichlor itself does any damage, although if you put it right over a step, sure. it obviously yeah. burns right. a hole, and, yeah. you know, uh, but uh, that's because it's concentrated and localized, right. you know, because uh, the pH is so low on that. Yeah. But the trichlor itself, um, you get different opinions on that. It's yeah. not, I don't think it's important mm. as the fact that the overall, yeah. what it can well, do, un yeah. unchecked. Well, I think it gets widely <laughs> abused, you know, in the industry. Yeah. So that's a, a big, I mean, we've, we've, the last few years, we've actually switched all over to pH or peak, you know, control yeah. systems. It's so, a terrific Because it's a great way to keep that pool water balance on a daily basis where the, the pool guy's not trying to pour enough in there to keep it through the week. And, you know, we're big a, ozone or UV yeah, guys. Ozone, I mean, yeah, we like that. A little bit of thing, chlorine right. to supplement that, you know, and right. uh, a lot less scale buildup and, right. you know, all kinds of beneficial issues. We're, we're big, uh, you know, we like the, uh, um, borates, you know, right. for pH stabilization yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Well, kind of like a one last thing. It's, you always hear this, and, uh, you know, that plaster seemed to last a lot longer back in the old days versus now. Is that is that some truth to that, or is that just like an urban myth? <laughs> well, that's let's reason through that question, right. okay? And let's use a little facts and reason to that. Um, back in the beginning, when they first started, it was white cement, no different, and uh, aggregate. Right now, we know the cement's the most soluble part of this. Right. right, marble is harder than calcium hydroxide. Let's just start with that. Right. Okay. okay, so you have those components in there. So the plaster lasting a long time. Remember those finishers who taught me hard trialed the bejesus out of these things, and they use calcium chloride and all those. Things right. you know that they had. They even used some asbestos back then, which right. really wasn't a strengthener as much as that actually held moisture into the product. Right. They really used it originally for as a gun lube to right. get it through the early pumps. Right. Um, but also back then they were on liquid chlorine. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, how far back do you want to go? I mean, I remember the chlorine yeah. was in glass bottles that you reused. Right. And you had to add it several times, you know. And so there was really nothing that aggressive going into that unless you were mm -hmm. running your pH way too low or right. do things like that. And so uh, right about the time, uh, I say they switched from uh, quartz aggregate to marble, within a five year period is about the time stabilized chlorine came out. Mm. So a couple things happened. Uh, we started going from a harder aggregate, which still held up, it's held up really right. well, and marble will too under a good situation, but about that same time you had that perfect storm right. of these, uh, of these um, you know, uh, stabilized chlorine then being used. Right. And uh, not a lot of understanding of the adjustment factor. Mm. And uh, I did a timeline, uh, industry timeline, right. uh, once I put it together and it shows uh, the material changes with the uh, sanitation product changes. Right. And it almost corresponds with research in the industry to figure out what spot etching is. Oh, okay. And break down, I mean, sure, five years later, all of a sudden, Dow Whitney at the University of Florida did a big study back in the 80s about spot etching, came out the same conclusions Cal Poly did. I mean, uh, right. NSPI did it, you know, and then uh, a bunch of other independent labs coming up with always the same conclusions. Right. You know, was nothing new under the sun. It's just basic cement chemistry. So properly done, a yeah. pool today will last just as long as back then. Right. Uh, if it's treated with the same, in, in the yeah. same environment. Yeah. Now, there was a company, I remember I talked to this guy, his name is Walt Cagle. It was Cagle and Hoy pool plastering back in the 70s. And all he did was replasters. 
And I ran into it at an NPC conference once, uh, I think it was in the early 2000s. I said, well, what in the heck were you replastering in the early 70s? Right. I mean, these are pools, you know, he says, oh, pools, they were all jacked up that were done from the 50s and 60s and they were chemically abused and falling apart and blah, blah, blah. So they had them back then too. There weren't as many pools, but this guy was just specializing in renovations right. on these seemingly bulletproof pools. And uh, uh, we just did a pool the other day that was plastered in 1950, original plaster. Wow. Now, it needed it for a long time. Right. I think it was all Baker Hydro Pool or something like right. that, right? Yeah. It was a big pool. It's 12 foot deep, right? And uh, the plaster they used to put on was about three eighths of an inch thick. They put on really thin, and they used a lot of water. Right. Because they used to wheelbarrow deliver it, and sure. wheelbarrows are bucketed, and you right. couldn't put thick mud on, and they ran really wet mud. Right. When I first started, they used a lot of water because that's the old guys did. And this is, you talk about water cement ratios. Right. These early guys had water cement ratios that would turn everybody, you know, the hair white these days. Right. But those held up for 50, 60, 70 years, some of them. Yeah. So uh, uh, I think the environment of the water on it has everything to do with the uh, mm -hmm. long-term durability, uh, you know, factors more than anything else. All things being equal, right? You know, water is yeah. a universal solvent, and so right, uh, absolutely. But uh, I mean, but there's always room to scotch on either side of yeah. any of those arguments. I think. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, well, uh, it's always been a question of mine. So. <laughs> So thanks for answering that because, you know, I've been in it since 1994 mm -hmm. or really 95. But uh, so it's always been a big thing. That, what, you know, like we I take over a new pool this was in, the, in the service industry and, you know, we do a remodel or something. And they're like, gosh, it just seems like I, I had a pool before and it, the plaster seemed to last a lot longer. And this plaster only lasted like five or six years before it was really you know, uh, you know, which is attributed to, you know, abuse, you know, like right. anything. Well, so. I've seen, you know, if you fill it with low calcium water <laughs> right. right out yeah. of the chute, right. okay, you got one foot in the grave or on a banana peel already, Yeah. and uh, and then you throw a floater in it, right. first thing you do, and five years later, yeah. what do you got, a, you know, right. you got an excrement sandwich on your hand and yeah. nobody's happy with it. Yeah. And uh, so is it the product right. or is it in the environment it was in? Right. Right. So, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, we just did a job the other day uh, that I replastered in like 1982. And so how long ago was that? Yeah. Right. And it and he just wanted a pebble finish. Right. You know, he, back then we all had dark hair when I did it originally. Right. Yeah. And now I remet the guy yeah. and, you know, he's probably 15 years older than me now. He's in his right. 80s. And he remembered us yeah. and uh, called us back out there. Right. But it was, you know, it was just we did it well. And yeah. uh it had a good startup and all that. The guy yeah. took care of himself. He was actually uh, an right. engineer. Right. Did his reading, knew what he's doing, read the all the information, and uh, yeah, I did a good job. In his well, yeah, years. A, that daily kind of he probably took care of it almost daily or at least every other day. So I've had a couple of customers in the past that, that didn't want to do the pool guy, and they're the same way. They were engineers or very particular about things, and and they were out there every day testing the water, yeah. or you know, they even dis the one night one customer even disconnect the PH or P feeders. He would just read it on his, uh, you know, on the app on the iPhone, and then he'd go out and do manual adjustments on mm -hmm. it. So that's because he didn't trust the feeder to. You know, and the funny thing about this pool is we simply sandblasted it, and then went right over it with a scratch coat with a little acrylic right. glue in there, and it wasn't one hollow area in the whole thing. Yeah, you know, right. thirty, yeah. forty years later, right. bonded tight as could be. Yeah. Right. And uh, so that just shows you how that practice yeah. worked. And you right. know, if it was done, everything, all things being done perfectly and right. seemed to hold up really well. Yeah. So. Yeah, great. Well, Alan, I appreciate you coming by today. I mean, yeah. it's been a wealth of information and it's always good good to get different perspectives on everything. And um, like I said, I know you've been around for a long time. I've heard your name ever since I've been in the business and uh, that's 24 years. So. <laughs> So yeah, well, since 81, I've yeah. been on my own and in the industry since 74. I, we right. love the industry. Yeah. It's fed my family. Right. Uh, put the kids in college. I have about 130 employees we employ, and uh, we have a lot of uh, super good people yeah. make a living, and it's a great industry. Right. I like it. Uh, um, everything about it, the pool service industry has been like our partner. Right. Uh, most of our ref referrals we get through them. They've built my company. Yeah. And uh, we love to give back to the industry, right. uh, and uh, it's been so good to us. And yeah. uh, and uh, you know, look okay. forward to a lot more years of this. We're not going anywhere. All right, well, yeah. great. Well, thanks for the education, which yeah. is what we're trying to do. Sure. So. All right, thanks. Thanks for listening to the Asset Masters podcast, and don't forget to check out our Facebook page each week on Tuesdays for new episodes of the show.
I also want to encourage you to stop by the Ask the Masters Facebook page and invite other like-minded individuals to join us there as well. Feel free to jump into the conversations and even post your own questions. We want to create a community which fosters learning and discovery for the betterment of us all. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify. Please be sure to subscribe and feel free to share. 